Even though we have the evolutionary adaptations to make us great long distance runners, the prevalence of injury in running is quite high. At any given time, between 19 and 79% of runners have some kind of injury. But prevalent statistics like these don't really tell us what the risk of doing an activity like running is. For that, we need to know the incidence of injury or the number of new injuries that occur over a specific period of time. And the incidence of injury is between 6.8 and 50 per thousand hours of running. This is quite a broad estimation. Differences in the types of runners being studied, the definitions of injury, how they are diagnosed, the reliance in some studies for participants to self-diagnose and self-report their injuries and a range of follow-up periods within studies can explain the wide estimates we see. The majority, around 80% of running injuries, are chronic rather than acute. Acute injuries present suddenly and are typically linked with a trauma, for example tearing a muscle or a fracture following a fall. Symptoms of an acute injury occur immediately or within 24 hours and include swelling, immediate pain and weakness. In contrast, chronic injuries develop over time, but often with no obvious trigger. Symptoms can include pain and weakness, but these symptoms may have less of a clear pattern. Research has consistently demonstrated that the most commonly reported injuries in runners occur in the knee, followed by the lower leg, the foot, the ankle, the thigh, and the hip. Common diagnoses include patellofemoral pain, iliotibial band pain, Achilles tendinopathy, sometimes called tendinitis, tears of the gastrocnemius or calf muscle, medial tibial stress syndrome, also called shin splints, plantar fasciitis, hamstring tear, and stress fractures. So why, if we have evolved to run long distances, aren't our bodies better adapted? Why are we apparently so prone to injury? One hypothesis is that running injury is what's known as a mismatch condition, like type 2 diabetes or myopia, which is short-sightedness, and it's caused by our bodies being poorly adapted to the modern environments in which we now live. From this perspective, running injuries would be less prevalent if we ran as we evolved to, consistently, not carrying any unneeded body fat, and barefoot. The problem with this idealistic way of thinking is that almost everything, including physical activities like running, involves a certain amount of risk even in a Paleolithic world. We've also evolved to get pregnant, to eat and walk, but pregnant mothers often get back pain, people sometimes choke on their food, and casual strollers everywhere trip and sprain their ankles. So why would running be any different? In reality, lots of variables exist and can interact to become risk factors for the development of injury. In injury epidemiology research, Risk factors are typically classified as being intrinsic, things which are internal to you, like your anthropometry, or extrinsic, which are external, like your training behaviours or footwear. Intrinsic risk factors can be further classified into non-modifiable, things that you can't change, like your age, and modifiable, like your body mass index. Hundreds of studies have been conducted to determine the risk factors for injury among different cohorts of runners. The trouble is that this kind of research is actually really difficult to do. Usually you start with a hypothesis. This hypothesis has to have a clear empirical rationale. It has to be grounded in research. Let's say, because we know, based on biomechanics studies, that because people with a higher body mass index experience greater impact forces at their knees and hips when running, our hypothesis is that heavier runners are at an increased risk of injury. We then need to recruit a group of runners, measure their BMI, and track them over time to see who becomes injured. But because only a certain proportion will go on to actually become injured during the study, we will usually have to recruit a large group to power our study. We'll also need to make sure that we have a qualified healthcare professional on our research team who can actually define and diagnose each injury and a way to measure the runner's BMI, which may change over the study period. This takes time and resources. There will also be dropouts, so you'll have to account for this and recruit more participants. So let's say over the course of a one-year period, 10% of our cohort of 1,000 runners experience an injury. How do we know that the injuries were due to some other factor that we didn't consider at the start of the study? 
it's possible that this group could have been running differently, training differently, or eating differently to the others, to name a few factors. The point is, we'll never know unless we measure these kinds of variables. And the more variables you measure in a study, the more participants you need to recruit so that your study is adequately powered from a statistical standpoint. The more participants you recruit, the more people you need on your research team to manage the incoming data. And the more data you are collecting, the more you'll see how these data seem to interact with one another, how it's not possible to separate one variable from another. They're all linked together. For example, what if you find there is no link between BMI and injury risk? You think this is a little unexpected, so you look a bit deeper into the data. Instead of looking at BMI as your primary outcome, you might look at body fat percentage or fat-free mass, and you find that runners who have a high BMI but who have lower body fat scores are not as high of a risk. And then you realize that naturally, males and females tend to have different levels of body fat percentage too, so you decide to further stratify your cohort in what's known as a subgroup analysis, and you find that those at the highest risk are males with higher BMI, but who also have high body fat percentage. But then, because training behaviours will impact this variable, you realise that this group is also undertaking lower weekly training mileage. So how can you be sure that the risk factor is related to body composition and not training? This is just a simple example. There could be many more layers to it. For instance, you may find that trends differ between younger and older runners, or for those who are more experienced. It's also worth pointing out that the sort of fishing for results I've described above, where you look to find associations on a whim, would actually be bad research practice. The best studies outline exactly what they are going to measure and analyse before the first participants are actually ever recruited by publishing their protocols. This minimises the risk of finding something by chance, which is known as a type 1 error in research. And then after all of this, after you've finished your study and published your results, other researchers might try to repeat your protocol and replicate your results in another population, in another part of the world, and they might find something completely different. The risk factors for injury in a cohort of Dublin-based runners may be very different to those in a cohort-based in the Rift Valley province in Kenya, for example. But despite all of these challenges and more, a vast catalogue of epidemiological research studies have been completed to date, investigating the intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors for injury in runners. These studies have been synthesised in systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which use statistical analyses to pool the results from multiple studies. Taken together, two risk factors have emerged that have consistently been linked with injury in runners. The first is an intrinsic risk factor. Having a previous history of injury makes you more likely to get injured again. The second is an extrinsic risk factor, training volume. When it comes to a previous history of injury, researchers have put forward two theories to explain why this increases subsequent injury risk. The first is known as the causality theory, in which incomplete or inadequate rehabilitation leads to increased risk for the previously injured tissue because of incomplete healing and weakness, altered movement patterns, loss of balance, or other functional or psychological impairments. The trouble with this theory is that injury risk should return to normal after adequate rehabilitation, but this is often not the case. So in the other theory, the non-causal marker theory, the previous injury is just a marker for other traits that cause an individual to be at a higher risk of injury. Certain people might be at a higher risk of injury due to genetic factors, risk-taking behaviour, or other non-genetic injury-prone characteristics like their training, playing position, running style, or psychological profile. In this theory, the previous injury does not causally increase the risk of a new injury, but rather it is simply a proxy for some other underlying cause. Ultimately, we don't know which of these theories is correct. The other risk factor is training volume, but the relationship is not a linear one. Analyses of the combined evidence from hundreds of small studies have shown that running injuries actually follow a U-shaped curve. The highest probabilities of injury are generally among novices, who start from a baseline of running very little and who then radically increase their mileage 
and among competitive ultramarathoners doing very high weekly mileages without adequate rest. Everyday runners in between these extremes are less prone to injury. For example, one research study showed that the risk of injury increases among runners with an average weekly training volume below 30 kilometers per week, whereas another showed that those with volumes of 65 kilometers or more per week are at an increased risk of injury. This would suggest that gradually increasing your mileage is actually protective because it forces your body to adapt to the training stimulus. But with an important caveat, novice runners risk injury because they can increase their mileage or speed or both faster than their shins, plantar fascia, Achilles tendons, iliotibial bands and other vulnerable tissues can adapt. But that's not the end of the story for the risk factors of injury in running. It's very likely that risk factors other than previous injury history and training volume exist. It's just that due to the challenges of conducting this kind of research, results do not always come out as consistent. Things like strength, running form or technique, essentially the biomechanics I previously talked about, and footwear have been shown to be associated with injury in some studies, but not others. The problem is that results are really difficult to generalize across runners with different body shapes and sizes. These factors all likely interact with one another and other risk factors too. So separating out their individual effects is almost impossible. So with all of those caveats in mind, starting with muscle strength, there is a logical reason why being weak may predispose us to injury. We use muscles not just to push our bodies forward, but also to control movements and reduce loads that can stress and injure tissues. Some research has shown that runners with weak core muscles and stabilizing muscles in their feet and legs are more at risk of injuries to the knee and elsewhere. The muscles alongside the hip, the hip abductors, that prevent the knees from collapsing inward during every step are a notorious weak link. When it comes to running form, the rationale is that if repetitive stress injuries arise from innumerable recurrent forceful movements, it stands to reason that some ways to run may be less stress inducing than others. Essentially, running is a skill which can be honed. This is controversial. Many would argue, myself included, that with the right training stimulus, over time, the body will settle on a preferred movement style of running that integrates the full network of sensory motor inputs and outputs to optimize our stride rate, how much we lean, how our foot strikes the ground, and how much we flex our hips, knees, and ankles, and much more. The preferred movement path paradigm posits that as long as we stick to this form, we are less likely to get injured. But an anthropological approach combined with what we know about running biomechanics suggests a different perspective. A perspective largely based on the idea that, just as there are better ways to swim or swing a golf club, there are better ways to run. Those in this camp agree on four key elements of good running form, which likely reduce your risk of injury, illustrated on screen. Although I would highlight that these features have not been consistently linked with either lower injury risk or better performance among runners. The first is not overstriding, which means landing with your feet too far in front of your body. This apparently prevents the legs from landing too stiffly and causing overly high braking forces that slow you down. The second is having a cadence of about 170 to 180 steps a minute. This is based on the finding that more experienced runners tend to have higher cadences. The third, not leaning too much, especially at the waist. The idea here is that too much upper body lean encourages overstriding and requires you to spend more energy preventing your torso from toppling forward, which is inefficient. Finally, landing with a nearly horizontal foot is considered optimal because it helps to avoid a large rapid impact force with the ground during heel strike. It also makes better use of the elasticity of your Achilles tendon to bounce out of each step. On this last point, Biomechanics studies comparing barefoot versus shod runners have shown that it is almost impossible not to adopt a forefoot strike pattern when barefoot, landing on the ball of your foot before nailing down the heel, because landing on your heel hurts without a cushioned shoe. Forefoot and midfoot strikes usually don't generate an impact peak on the ground, that rapid large collisional force that is painful without shoes. Forefoot and midfoot strikes also generate rotational forces, or torques that are lower in the knee but higher in the ankle. 
requiring strong calf muscles and Achilles tendons, which can lead to problems for people trying to transition to this way of running. And that brings up the final most controversial risk factor for injury, what we run on, namely running shoes. That's what we'll be discussing in the next lecture.